Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. My name is Jess Cahill, and I'm a graduating Health Law Fellow. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I graduated from Fordham University in 2010, where I studied American Studies and Political Science, which basically made me a shoe in for law school, but I wasn't quite ready at the time, so I went to work for a few years. And in that time, I worked for Willis, which is a global health insurance broker. And while I was there, um, well, I was first introduced to wellness programs, um, basically helping my clients cra craft their own wellness programs. And also in that time, um, the Affordable Care Act was upheld. So that was really the impetus somehow for me to go to law school because I had to start advising my clients on how the ACA impacted them and how they had to change their benefit plans and things of that nature. So it ended up with me going to law school and here I am today. All right, here's what we're gonna go through today. Um, I'm just gonna let you know a little bit about wellness programs, what they are, and we're gonna discuss the legal framework and some challenges there. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with an example of how I got to put some of this knowledge to use this semester in a clinic at Brooklyn Law School. All right, so what is a wellness program? It's a group of employer-sponsored activities that seek to improve health, prevent disease, and in an ideal world, lower insurance costs. So this is a very broad umbrella. Um, some of you may have had employers that offer reimbursement for joining a gym or you know, offer walking challenges. It's a very, very broad term. Um, and basically, employers will offer an incentive to take part or a penalty in some cases for not taking part. So to understand why wellness programs are becoming more and more popular, because they really are, um, I think the latest statistic is that almost 80% of employers, large and small, offer some type of wellness program. Um, and to understand why, you need to look at the broader healthcare landscape right now. It's no secret that the US leads the world in, with chronic diseases, um, including things like diabetes, heart disease, and lung disease. Um, and in addition, healthcare costs are rising. So employers are paying more to offer health plans to their employees. Employees are paying more out of their paychecks to take part in these, in these plans. And they're also, plan designs are changing to become less and less generous. So basically, you know, gone are the days of a copay plan where you go to the doctor, you pay 20 bucks, and that's it. Um, there's a lot of high deductible health plans now where anyone who's using their health insurance is really paying for it. So the main point here is that wellness programs are a way to give a little bit back to employees as consumers of healthcare. It's a way for them to kind of defray these rising healthcare costs. Okay, so employers have some flexibility in designing these programs, but they fall largely into two buckets. P participatory programs are pretty self-explanatory. Um, employees are eligible for a reward by taking part in a wellness-related activity. So again, this is something like joining a gym with a you know, reimbursement from your employer taking part in a health education seminar, um, or two of the most popular ones are taking a health risk assessment, or an HRA, which is basically a questionnaire that seeks to get a view of someone's personal health, and they, it asks things like, how often do you exercise, do you smoke, do you drink, things like that. Um, and also biometric screenings are also a very popular part of wellness programs. It's essentially a physical. Um, and then there's health contingent programs. These require a little bit more of employees in order to be eligible for the reward, and there's two types. Activity-only programs are those where an employee must complete an activity related to a health factor. So that would be something like a walking challenge, or a diet program, or joining a smoking cessation program offered by their employer. Outcome-based outcome -based programs go a little bit further in that they require the employee to achieve a certain outcome. So something like this would be actually quitting smoking rather than just taking part in the smoking cessation program. So again, employers have a lot of flexibility in how they'd like to reward people. Um, and this was one of my favorite parts of my job before school where I was helping employers figure out you know, how to incentivize people to want to take part in something like this. So the best way to do it, in my opinion, was to just send out a survey and ask employees, what would you know, incentivize you the most? Would it be cash? Would it be a paid vacation day? Things like that. Um, and so employees really do have a lot of flexibility. Some tie it to the health plan itself. So you can, if you get a physical exam, you can get basically a break on your deductible, things like that. So there is some flexibility there. And this is the alphabet soup slide. So the Affordable Care Act um, impacted wellness programs a little bit. It increased the allowable reward amount from 20% to 30% of the cost of coverage. 
And it also added some requirements to protect employees, um, like making sure the program is reasonably designed to promote health, so it wasn't just a ruse. Um, in addition, HIPAA, everyone knows HIPAA basically for um, protecting people's privacy, and that definitely goes into play here. But in terms of wellness programs, it also means that people can't be charged more for healthcare coverage. Um, so for participatory programs, it's really easy to comply with HIPAA because you're just participating, there's nothing else. But for those contingent programs, there are some more stringent non-discrimination requirements. So in addition to meeting regular requirements, an employer must also offer a reasonable alternative standard or a waiver to employees. The Americans with Disabilities Act, as it relates to wellness programs, basically means that an employer cannot require a medical examination. Um, and there is a exception there, which we're gonna go through on the next slide. And the Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act basically means that an employer cannot inquire into family medical history. So we don't want employers you know, asking people what their genetic makeup is to see what diseases they might have a prevalence for, because then wellness programs could really be a ruse for you know, terminating employees that might have a higher prevalence for a disease and you know, therefore raise insurance claim costs and things like that. So the main point of these laws is basically confidentiality and non-discrimination. So far, the legal challenges to wellness programs have been on ADA grounds. Um, again, remember the ADA means employers cannot require employees to take medical examinations, but a health risk assessment and a, bi and a biometric screening are basically that. So there is a safe harbor under the ADA for employers that offer wellness programs. It's a two-pronged test. Um, the program must be part of the health plan that the employer offers, and the program must be based on underwriting or classifying risks. So if both of those factors are met, then an employer, the ADA safe harbor will apply to the employer. So one of the first challenges you can see on the left was in Broward County down in Florida, where the employer required employees to take the, an HRA and a biometric screening or get $20 deducted out of their paycheck. Um, and the court found that the ADA safe harbor applied. It was part of the plan because the insurer paid for it and administered it. The employer was never seeing any of this data that was coming back. It was all administered by the health plan. And it was based on underwriting because the employer was using it to structure the benefit plan. Similarly, in a more recent case out of Wisconsin, um, the employer went a step further and said that employees could not even participate in the health plan unless they took the HRA and biometric screening. And again, the court found that the ADA safe harbor did apply. Um, it was part of the plan because it was necessary to coverage. And it was based on underwriting because aggregate data was used to, <coughs> excuse me, was used to calculate the company's benefit costs. Okay, so this is the most exciting part to me. <laughs> I took part in the Blip Clinic this semester, which is basically a law firm for startups. Um, so I had a definite geek moment when a wellness company walked in the door and we were able to represent them. I was very excited to put some of this knowledge to use. Um, and basically they're a third party that assists other small startup companies with creating their own wellness programs. Um, so they do a lot of on-site activities like bringing in a masseuse, bringing in an acupuncturist, so things that are great for everyone. <laughs> so there weren't a lot of compliance issues there for us to dig into, just to make sure that it's voluntary and to make sure that no confidential information was being shared with employers. Um, but they were also offering a health risk assessment through a third party. Um, but again, as we just discussed, there's a lot of compliance issues there. Um, so our biggest advice to them, and I think we were able to really help them understand the regulations around it, <coughs> was to make sure that employees were only receiving aggregate data, no personal data that could identify anyone, and to also make sure they weren't inquiring into family history. So this client pointed out some important information to us, namely that these, are, these programs are only gonna continue to grow. As millennials enter the workforce, people want work-life balance, they're even, even willing to forego some pay in order for that. So, I think the main takeaway here is that wellness programs are here to stay. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Professor Porter, for organizing everything and uh, 
and I'm very excited for the uh, opportunity to do this to a topic I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, I will be talking to you about medical practice today. Let me work this. Go one to the right. Okay, so a topic that's pretty current. Uh, my guess is it'll be coming up in the next year or so uh, during the elections, as it usually does. So I figured it may be a pretty interesting topic to um, review today. Uh, what I have over here is a general slide about the uh, effects, negative effects, by the way, of medical malpractice. Um, I have here uh, defensive medicine. Is, uh, these, are, these are the most common claims that are made by people arguing for reform, typically. Uh, so we have defensive medicine. Um, uh, billions of dollars are wasted on it. We have uh, cost, which is related to defensive medicine. Uh, it's a significant factor in the, um, the, the, what's been mentioned, the much increased cost of healthcare these days. Frivolous lawsuits is another uh, big claim. We have the, uh, the effect on doctors that are often cited, things like uh, doctors going out of business to, uh, due to increased costs. And uh, finally, we have uh, a claim that the system is useless, does not accomplish anything. So how, how many of you have heard of these uh, claims in the past? How many of you um, think these claims are, uh, make sense? Some people. I, um, I, I thought a lot of them made sense as well, especially when you, um, when you uh, think about them at least, uh, logically. But what I decided to do now that I'm becoming an attorney and, um, and uh, I should be, always be a patient advocate, but you somehow also want to see every side as an attorney. I uh, began reviewing a lot of the actual data uh, on the topic from various medical journals and um, as well as uh, law books on the topic. Um, what I have, before I even begin, um, I will say the following, that these five kind of uh, statements are what's been referred to in certain books as the medical malpractice myth in the United States. Uh, so I know I, uh, n not sure of how many of you read the abstract, but that's uh, the point of this, uh, of this talk. And um, what I want to share is just a quick story for how this becomes a, a supposed reality. I've been, I've been working with, the, uh, with a law firm here. Gary A. Zucker uh, is the head of the law firm. It's right here in downtown Brooklyn. I've been reviewing medical practice cases, evaluating the cases to see whether there is merit to them. And uh, I'll give you just a quick example of a story that is the type of story that we, we see a lot. Several months ago, we were contacted by a 40-year-old uh, lady who um, uh, told us that uh, she had been diagnosed stage four uterine cancer. And uh, she had reason to suspect that something was done wrong in her case. We obtained the records, as we usually do. And after looking at the records, I saw that she had a uh, visit with her gynecologist, a yearly visit. Uh, where she was complaining of abnormal uh, uh, period bleeding in between uh, periods. And uh, there is a very important test that should be done in those type of scenarios. You do a, um, a biopsy of the uterus in order to make sure that it's not something like cancer. And um, for some reason, that wasn't done in that situation. She's a single mother of four, and um, she was now dealing, having to deal with this issue that a year later is is very certainly could have been uh, mitigated or at least, um, or even prevented uh, altogether. Um, that's, that's the kind of background of the kind of cases we deal with, but what I wanted to show you is um, the kind of curr the current uh, thought in New York and the thought in New York about 150 years ago. Uh, what we have here, this is an email I received uh, a few months ago in February of, uh, 12th. And uh, doctors are under attack is the title of the email. And uh, if you start reading, this is uh, referring to the malpractice crisis in, uh, in New York. And here is an interesting uh, quote from uh, 1851. We have a mischievous prosecutions for some years have alarmed medical gentlemen to such a degree that many have concluded to let all surgical patients go unassisted in their afflictions. So this is nothing new. Uh, these uh, the five kind of ideas that I listed earlier. So what I wanted to do though is review the actual data on the topic again and um, and see uh, and see what it says. I have a little bit of an overview of errors in the United States. This is uh, some pretty amazing statistics. 
440,000 deaths a year are uh, found to be preventable uh, and caused by medical error. That makes it the third leading cause of death in the U.S. currently. Um, we have, uh, the injuries are obviously a lot greater than this too. What I won't be doing in this presentation is, you know, it's a, this is a broad topic, so I can't, I won't be going into uh, preventing these errors medically or, um, or even the many, the many other topics that are related to this. Instead, I'll just be looking at these five uh, myths. So I have a lot of data on these uh, slides, and the reason is is because I tried to compare what, what the basis is and the um, actual reality. So I'll go over them, and I'll try to do so quickly. Uh, we have uh, the first myth is that it caused defensive medicine. Def defensive medicine, for those, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have heard of it, but uh, it means providing care that you would not have provided if you didn't fear litigation. And um, the mo if you look at any of the you know, most reliable journals these days, what they're citing often is this 1994 study by a governmental um, agency over here that uh, basically reported that the uh, defensive medicine is very common and what it used was mainly physician surveys. It asked physicians, are you worried about medical malpractice? And if so, uh, what do you, um, uh, does it change the way you practice medicine? They said yes, and they said, therefore medical malpractice, uh, defensive medicine exists. However, I do, I will provide you with an actual article that studied the changes in care. New England Journal of Medicine, New England Journal of Medicine is the uh, foremost medical journal in, uh, one of the foremost ones in the United States, just last year in 2014, um, found no reduction. It compared states that had medical malpractice um, reform, ones that did not, and it found absolutely zero uh, reduction, difference in care, difference in costs. There was one state, Georgia, that found a very small difference in costs, but um, that's what the empirical data, and I'm gonna try to speed it up through the other myths. So we have, um, that the system costs too much due to these medical malpractice claims. Uh, I have a quote here from, from Bush. You can uh, uh, read later, but from 2005, uh, I'm sure more quotes are gonna be coming in the next year or so. But uh, the base for this myth, we have a Health Affairs, Affairs Journal article uh, that says, uh, estimates $55 billion a year are coming from medical malpractice uh, claims and costs. Uh, they find this is 2.4% of healthcare costs. Uh, this is often cited as, uh, as uh, evidence that medical malpractice litigation costs so much. If you actually look at the article, uh, the authors in the article, this is on the right side for the reality, authors qualify the estimate as saying that it's, uh, the evidence is low and it's, um, it's much smaller than imagined uh, because it is 2.4%. But I will tell you that if you look at the estimates, 45 billion out of the 55 billion are that defensive me are attributed to the defensive medicine relied upon by the surveys to physicians. Uh, taken together, the role for medical malpractice costs as part of the healthcare cost is negligible. I also have here lawsuits uh, being carried out without merit. Uh, again, we have um, we have a study actually from Harvard, uh, New England Journal of Medicine article again. It says ne nearly 40 percent of claims that are filed do not have merit in medical malpractice. Same article says, if you look on the right, that this profile of, um, if you look at the second bullet point, it says that claims without merit were generally resolved appropriately, and they accounted for less than 13% of total litig litigation costs. So what they conclude is that the profile of the non-error claims observed does not square with the notion of the opportunistic trial attorneys pursuing questionable lawsuits. And again, people cite these very same studies to say that a lot, there are a lot of frivolous lawsuits and uh, they, they cost the system a lot. Uh, number four, uh, we have doctors can no longer practice medicine. Here, this is again full of, uh, 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 we have here a, bu a bunch of anecdotal stories. If you look on the right again, we have studies showing uh, premium increases, which you would think would cost a lot for uh, physicians, have no effect on physician incomes in the U.S. And these are from actual economic studies. And all of the empirical studies on this uh, show no effect on physician supply in a given state. Um, number five we have here, that the system is useless. The only, one of the big things that I will say is that I have not found evidence that medical malpractice 
uh, besides a small study done by the Congress that said that medical malpractice decreased um, uh, mortality uh, by like a few percentage points, uh, there's not been evidence that medical malpractice improves healthcare. And that's the biggest um, thing that I would say is against, um, is ag against the positive aspects of it. But the reality is that, uh, like the case I gave earlier with a mother with the four children, uh, these are, uh, there are very important aspects to the system that um, are, uh, are very useful for patients. The conclusions, what I, is basically what we have over here is the biased surveys of physicians, anecdotal stories versus the high quality empirical data from high impact journals. I, um, it sounds, the, the, this is, I've uh, been pretty amazed with my review of all the uh, journal articles and the data on the topic and pretty amazed that um, on all the articles that cite uh, data that is not strong given medicine is a very data driven uh, topic but this, um, uh, ho hopefully this is a uh, relevant topic for this upcoming year's uh, election. Thank you very much. I am the last thing between you and your lunch. I am aware of it, <laughs> and just bear with me. Um, so I studied uh, biochemistry, and I spent a year using recombinant DNA technologies to study cancer cells. Um, recombinant DNA technology takes a piece of DNA and com combine it with a mediator and then uh, incorporate the whole complex into a foreign cell. It's the same technology that has been used to create GMO food. So I have always interested in GMOs. And as I was writing uh, on my note, which is about GMO labeling, um, I get a chance to learn more about food law. Um, so this, which led to my uh, presentation today that I want to share with you. Oh, sorry. Uh, last year, I participated in the Food Law Student Leadership Summit that was organized by Harvard. Um, it's a three-day event uh, with students coming from all over the country. And after that event, the same team that organized the, the summit um, started a student network. It's not really student, but it's a national network that um, intended to gather students and lawyers who are interested in uh, food law and policy. So inspired by that event, um, I coming back to Brooklyn Law School, I invited Pro Professor Michael Reese, who's in the back right now, uh, to talk to us <laughs> about uh, what he practiced. And he is a lo lawyer practicing class actions, uh, class action litigations in food law. Um, so we learned from Professor Reese that um, to conceptualize food law, there are many ways. You could think of it as a area of law that is multidoctrinal, or you could think of it as a collection of uh, legal and social controversies. Or from the re regulatory perspective, uh, the, the food law touches many aspects of various um, regulation systems. Um, and finally, the part three of my uh, project is my note, which talks about GMOs. And I propose classification as a solution to, to the, to the very hot, very hot uh, genetic and modified food labeling debate. Um, when I was studying in the, U in the UK, one of the first things I was taught is that unlike the British or the Europeans, Americans love their genetically modified food. That was more than 10 years ago, and I guess that's not the case in recent years. So the, the debate is very hot, and people debate on uh, environmental impacts or um, the, how much food price will increase. But the, the, the discussion is largely based on the assumption that the GMO food has uniform characteristics and a blanket regulation should govern them all, but that is not the case. Um, depends on the incorporated traits. GM food can have positive and negative impacts on the environment, and it could, some corps will, again, depends on the traits, uh, will impact food price more than the others. So I propose to classify them all and um, impose regulations accordingly. So uh, under current law, the federal system has a, corporated, a coordinated framework under which the FDA regulates the food coming out of the GMOs. And the um, 
uh, USDA regulates the, the, the actual plants, and EPA regulates the pesticide if it were incorporated into the plants. Within the FDA itself, they have a plant bio, uh, the plant biotechnology consultation program to regulate the, the, the food uh, before it goes into the market. Technically, this is a voluntary program, but all uh, food developers participate in it. And with regard to labeling policy, uh, the FDA has stated since 1992 that uh, GMOs as a class is not materially different from the traditional counterparts, so labeling is not required. This policy has been confirmed uh, by, by the court. Um, at the state level, Vermont passed, it, passed its uh, mandatory labeling law last year, uh, actually 2015, uh, 14, um, and immediately after its passage, it was challenged in the District Court of Vermont. Um, currently, the case is still pending, but the law will go into effect on, on July 1st this year. And similarly, Connecticut and Maine passed its mandatory labeling law, but they won't go into effect unless uh, the, their neighboring states also pass similar laws. Back to the federal level, the House has passed the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act of 2015, uh, which will preserve the current uh, voluntary status of the regulatory policy, uh, but it will preempt all state mandatory laws. Uh, but only last, last month, the Senate has introduced the Biotechnology Food Labeling Uniformity Act, which will mandate uh, labeling. But uh, none of those bills has come into law yet, uh, and the fight is still ongoing. So what exactly are people fighting about? Here are the four um, most common arguments that people brought up on the both sides. Um, of Because I don't have too much time, uh, I'm going to only talk about the food safety concerns which is of the central concern to the general public, and it's the reason that prompted the debate. Um, however, the scientific community is unanimous on this issue. Um, there are research that about like 270 entities has attest to the safety of GM food, and the examples on the right are just some of the most predominant entities. However, the general public remained skeptical. Um, like I said um, previously, the GMOs are, made, are not created the same. Of the 170 uh, GMOs that has been approved, the majority of them have first generation traits. Those are the traits that enhance input, like herbicide tolerance, uh, insect resistance, or resistance to environmental stress, such as drought. Um, only about third of, 30 of them are, have, are second generation traits. The traits that have value adding uh, output, such as the apple that doesn't turn brown, or the canola oil that have an enhanced um, nutritional profile, or the potatoes that have less um, uh, acronamide formation, uh, which, it, which have been identified to lead to cancer. Uh, so those are the traits that are called second generation traits. Um, so current regulation recognizes those differences and regulate them differently, but only on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. So the outcome, the result, is a, a system that is highly technical, uh, both legally and scientifically, and which compromises transparency, and which probably leads to the uh, lack of tr public trust. So I propose to ca classify all the gen gen genetically modified food into uh, one of those four categories and impose different regulations um, depends on their traits. For example, uh, for class one, which is the second generation traits. Remember I just mentioned uh, the GMOs as a class is not materially different from the traditional counterparts, but some specific ones are. And the FDA actually used the canola oil and the potato as examples to illustrate when labeling is required. So I, I propose to just impose mandatory labeling on the class as, as a whole uh, for, for many reasons. First, it's already required under the law. It's just on the case-by-case -case basis. Uh, secondly, informed decision arguments uh, from the previous side and um, autonomy-based arguments are the strongest with this, with this um, class. And food, food safety concerns are the strongest too, uh, consider the modifi modification happens in the part of the plant that people put in their mouths directly. 
Uh, and finally, you would think the manufacturers or the developers would want to advertise their, their um, product, uh, not only because they put all the resource in it, but also their research suggests that uh, customers would want to pre pay premium uh, for, for the second generation traits. Uh, so the, the interest might be aligned and mandatory labeling may be able to impose without much kicking and scream, screaming. So I, I apologize, I don't have too much time to discuss all the other classes. But to conclude, uh, food law is a fast growing area of law that kind of touches some of the society's most pressing concerns. And um, it's my goal to, through this project, to bring awareness to some of the, the concerns and to share the valuable resources that, that is available out there and by uh, making a proposal that hopefully will promote uh, transparency and public trust. Thank you. So I want to thank our final uh, panel of fellows. Um, I don't want to give them short shrift by not having questions, so I'm going to invite anybody who would like to uh, pose a question to do so at this time. Um, so excellent job, everybody. Um, my question is for Guy because I also work at a medical malpractice firm. Um, and so thanks for the broad economic overview on those myths. And I was wondering if you got any impression on the effect medical malpractice has on the standard of care for medicine, because it is like determined by the medical community. But do you think uh, it has a plaintiffs in the medical malpractice profession have a uh, positive effect in enforcing those standards? Or do they kind of distort the uh, standard by because jury trials are unpredictable, which pushes defendants to settle. So, uh, first of all, I absolutely don't think they uh, distort uh, the standards. The, and, and jury trial, by the way, also defense firms are not, from what I've seen, not, never pushed to settle. If they have even a decent case, they're going to trial because 80% of these cases, and I didn't get to those statistics, but 80% of these cases uh, go for defendants even though, uh, as we've seen, they do have merit. They're disposed of appropriately, if, if not. But in terms of um, do they affect the standard of care, that, that's a point that I briefly mentioned earlier, that uh, there is not enough evidence, in terms of I'm not even sharing what I believe, but there's not enough evidence that has uh, come out to say that they improve the standard of care. Uh, what I do know is that the standard you mentioned, guide, did you mention guidelines, for example? They, a lot of times, uh, target the standard of care, and those I, I began reading, and another topic that I, I'd like to look into, but they even began developing, those guidelines became developing because of litigation, which uh, I think those guidelines are a big avenue in the future to try to reduce those numbers. We saw about 440,000 uh, preventable deaths every uh, year. Um, that's Hopefully that answers uh, some of the questions. Neil thank you for your question. Any other questions? Oh, hello. My question was for Dexon. And um, I think your research is absolutely fascinating. Um, and food law is very important um, and will be more prevalent in the future. And um, I basically want to ask you a question, a general question. Um, do you think that um, this country can I guess, be stabilized the food market without GMOs completely, uh, how would, what would the effect of that be? I know uh, organic food is more expensive, it's harder to store. I know me, I go to Whole Foods and it's very expensive for me sometimes. So do you think that this country can shift to non-GMOs and actually it would be sustainable? Um, I probably is biased because I have a science background, so I'm pro-GMO. Um, but, so take my opinion with a grain of salt. But that being said, um, there are research, I didn't talk about it, uh, about food price. Uh, there's one study by a Cornell professor called uh, William Lesser, who studied that in New York State with a family of four, uh, if uh, GM labeling, just labeling, without taking out the GMO in general, just labeling is imposed, uh, the annual food price could grow somewhere from $48 to over $1,500. Uh, the, the best estimate is about 500 per person annually, 
and the midpoint would be eight hundred dollars. Um, so the that that is just uh, the uh, and very quick uh, estimate. But um, I think if you're talking about uh, more than just price, um, GMOs actually like U the USDA has pr has concluded that GMOs help. Preserve, uh, preserve the environment in many ways. Uh, it shifts the, the use of herbicide from the, the very toxic and persistent ones to the uh, less to toxic and actually, which actually provides uh, better environmental protection. And GMOs preserve the environment by conservative tilting, uh, which will save soil, save water, and um, save the elimination of um, gases. Into, into the into the into the air, uh, air space, I mean, uh, into into the environment. So uh, GMOs has many impacts on food price, environment, um, and I, I think it the world is, will be better with GMOs. And uh, well, I'm not sure we're willing to pay the price uh, without without it. It's just a matter of regulation to keep it under control, uh, to to keep the public informed, and so and the public. Can be involved in the decision making processes, and instead of just impose anything um, on us. So, our last question, or uh, my question is for Jessica. Um, I was just wondering if wellness plans are treated um, for tax purposes more like healthcare, or if they're taxable to the employee as compensation, or if it varies depending. Um, it's not all that common to give employees cash to give the incentive in the form of cash. Like usually, it's you know, a vacation day or something like that. Um, but I believe that it is tax when it does take the form of cash, not a gift card, but if it's like an incentive, like if it's tied to the health plan, it's not, but if it goes directly into their paycheck, then it is tax. Thank you. Thank you for your attention, uh, for your presence at today's uh, presentations and luncheon. And I invite you now all to share lunch with us. For those of you who might need a kosher meal, there are a few kosher meals available. Uh, they're sandwiches and they're not a hot meal. I'm sorry for that, but there are. So please let us know if that's a need that you have. Thank you very much.